We've been continuing our series in the book of Judges, and I don't know about you, but I've actually been enjoying the messages myself. Uh, I was like, wow, I didn't re- believe I said that. Ooh, I said that too. Ooh, that's pretty good. It's been good. I don't know about you. I'm just entertaining myself sometimes. Honestly, I'm preaching to a camera, and there's nobody in the room, and it's preaching to a camera, and I said it before. I'm going to say it again. It's like kissing a mannequin. I've never kissed a mannequin before, but I would imagine if I did, it would not kiss back. Somebody say Amen. But I love the crowd. I love being in front of you. I love seeing you. I can't wait to see the other half of you one day when we no longer have to wear these ridiculous things. Come on. Believe in for it in Jesus' name. But it is what it is, and we have to wear it for the time being. But here's what I know, that during this series, it has definitely kind of framed what's going on in our country and in our state, framed what's happening in the world today, and actually has filled me with more hope and more faith than ever before. I said to myself, I should have done Judges a long time ago, maybe when we first went into this lockdown, but it was absolutely necessary. If you look in the book of Judges, we go from Gideon last week, and we talked about the victory that Gideon had. God gave him a victory, going from 32,000 warriors, all of a sudden, now you got 300 in just a, uh, in a matter of moments or in hours, and this is all that you've got left, and God comes through with an incredible victory that Israel had never expected or had never seen, and God did something powerful. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at what happens after Gideon, what happens after the battle, what happens after the miracles in our lives, what happens when we get the the assured victory of God, and then all of a sudden, people, by time goes by, and people begin to slide into what you and I would begin to see as another apostasy and another anarchy, because this is basically what's going on during that time. It's an apostasy and an anarchy, and the people are turning away from God once again. So God goes through another set of judges, two or three of them, and now we find ourselves in the book of Judges chapter 12, where we begin to see that in those days, it said, again, it was like, in those days, Israel had no king, so everyone did what seemed right in their own eyes. And to me, every time I read that, I read it and I think to myself, how sad, how sad that Israel had no king. But when you look at what's happening with Israel during this time, it kind of adds to what's going on in America. It's, going, it's happening what's happening in the world, actually, not just America. Because that was a common theme. In those days, watch this, Israel had no king. You need a king? Do you need a king? You don't need a king. You already got your king. Your king is God. Somebody say amen. Amen. He already was. And that's a little small, but that's okay. We'll make it work. But then, (laughs) thank you, Micah. In those days, Israel had no king. And you don't really need a king because God had already written his word on their hearts. And he told them that. So you didn't need a king. So everyone did what seemed right in their own eyes. So everyone, everybody said, this is according to the way that I see things. This is the way I'm going to do it. And so all of the restraints, all of the boundaries, everything that God had for them, they began to cast it off again. So God raises up another judge, and he raises up another guy, and his name is Jephthah. And God raises up Jephthah, and the Bible tells us that as he raises up Jephthah, there are two families that have gone to war. One is Manasseh, and one is Ephraim. If you know the whole tribes of Israel, there's 12 of them. Joseph was one of the sons of Jacob, and Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, began to have two tribes. If you look here on the screen, there you have Ephraim, and then you have Manasseh. They came out of Joseph. Benjamin was the youngest brother. These are the 12 tribes of Israel, and when the land was allotted to the Israelites, they were broken up into tribes. This tribe got this amount of land. This tribe got that ahupua'a. You know what I'm talking about? This tribe got that district for real. That's the way that it worked. And this is the way that they did it. And God gave it to them. So now Ephraim and Manasseh were two brothers. And let me tell you, they were born to, J- uh, to, to Joseph while Joseph was in Egypt. And he was the number two man in all of Egypt at that time. If you remember Pharaoh, it was during that time. When you look at that, this is what we have to understand. Is Manasseh, he named him Manasseh. Now, when you named your children, they were prophetic names, or they talked about the season that you were in, so he names him Manasseh. Manasseh actually means, God has made me forget my hardship. He named that. He named it, God has made me forget my hardship. And then the other son, Ephraim, he says, God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. So now when they get into the promised land and hundreds of years go by, now you've got Ephraim and Manasseh out of all of the two, two, two tribes of Israel. You would not expect that those two would go to civil war together, but they did. There was a division between them. 
And now you've got the Ephraimites who are fighting with the Manassehites, and Jephthah is from Manasseh. I know there's a lot of tribes to think about, but here is the crux of what I want to share with you today. During a time when the tribe of Israel should have come together and identified a common enemy, they actually began to fight with one another instead. Right now, not, never mind the nation, in the body of Christ, we should identify the common enemy and go after the common enemy rather than fighting between us in the name of Jesus. So now it begins to say in verse 5, it says, Jephthah captured the shallow crossings of the Jordan River. So there was this feud going on. The Jordan River was the main part that if you captured this, the place where everybody crossed, you were in command and you were in control. And then it says online, watch this. Jephthah captured the shallow crossings of the Jordan River. And whenever a fugitive from Ephraim tried to go back across, the men of Gilead would challenge him. They would say to him, are you a member of the tribe of Ephraim? They would ask. And if the man said, no, I'm not, because he was lying, he was trying to lie, they would tell him, well, then say Shibboleth. And if he was from Ephraim, he would say Sibboleth. Because the people from Ephraim cannot pronounce the word correctly. <laughs> As I wait, come on, brother. Hey, are you crossing? Yeah, where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you from? Oh, I'm from the hills, the hills. Are you from Ephraim? No, no, I'm not from Ephraim. Say Shibboleth. So, uh, oh, can you give me another word? <laughs> say Shibboleth. And the guy would say Sibboleth. And if he couldn't say it the right way, the way that you were to pronounce it, you were from Ephraim. And what would they do? The Manassehites, they would kill him. They would kill him. So then it says this, because this is that, look, I just want to tell you, this is that time in Israel where they were doing the unthinkable. They were doing the unthinkable. They were doing, it, it, they were crushing God's heart over the way that they were conducting their affairs, the way that they were worshiping other gods, the way that they were actually killing one another and doing even worse things than that. And God was, this is how bad it got. This is how much it spiraled out of control. Until one day, God's going to say, you want a king? I'll give you a king. I'm going to give you a king. We'll get to that later on. But here it is. Manasseh and Ephraim, and they're fighting. They said, say Shibboleth. They say they can't. They say Sibboleth because the people from Ephraim cannot pronounce the word correctly. And then they would take him and kill him at the shallow crossings of the Jordan River. And in all, 42,000 of these men, these Ephraimites, were killed at that time. I want to share with you today, not necessarily about the historical context of this meeting and this this confrontation that took place in Israel by the Jordan River. What I want to talk about is about language. I want to talk about three lessons that you and I can get out of a crossing. Come on, somebody. When you're going through a crossing over, when you're crossing into one season and to the next, when you're going over through the darkest, deepest time of your life, and now you're going into the shallow ground, I want to share with you some things that are absolutely important that's going to help us. Somebody say amen. Amen. Because it's not about what, only about what you say, it's how you say it. It's not just about what you say, it's how you say it. It's not, how are you gonna, how are you gonna define this time? You're gonna define it as a shibboleth or you're gonna say shibboleth? How are you gonna define this time? Because every single one of us, as Christ followers, we have an accent. There is an accent. And the question is, is your accent of the kingdom or is your accent of the world, even though you're saved in the name of Jesus, right? Because I've been noticing my accent lately. Lately, My accent's been a little bit more edgier. My accent's been a little bit more frustrated. My accent, there are things about my accent that I'm not liking. Maybe my language might be right. Maybe I didn't say anything wrong. Maybe I didn't, I, I didn't swear. I didn't cuss. I didn't curse. But there was a, there's been an edge to my language lately. I don't know if I'm the only one in the room who's willing to confess this. Thank you. I am amongst friends and family, as I can see. May the Lord bless you. Everybody else who's lying, God is watching. I just want you to know. But there's something to the, the way that my language has been lately. And it's not that I've been dropping F-bombs. Again, I didn't say that. I, didn't, I, I haven't been swearing. But there's been, there's, been, there's been a little bit of poison. There's been, been a little bit of venom. And I don't know about you, but I need to repent. And then repent again, because I'm probably going to go back there again. And repent again. But I want to share with you, as my friend Steve Kelly writes in his book, The Accent of Leadership. He says this, that the accent of leadership is distinguished. The leaders of God's kingdom speak with a noticeable accent. 
They use words of life. They speak with one voice. Men and women who understand the power of accent of leadership and the power of their words can accomplish great things for God. Those who do not will eventually be left on the side and they simply do not sound right. Again, I say it's not about only about what you say. It's how you say it. It's how you say it. When you go through deep waters of life and you end up at the shallow crossings of life, your language, your choice of words can actually block your crossing over into the next area because you're stuck on the other side of the river. I want to give you three Lessons for the crossing. Three lessons that I'm learning right now in real time that I'd love to share with you later on about some interesting things that have happened lately. The first one, if you're ready, somebody say, I'm ready. ready. Come on, everybody say, I'm ready. ready. Number one, here it is. Number one, your accent will reveal your location. Your accent will reveal your location. We're going to know where you're at by your accent. As a matter of fact, uh, you don't need a transmitter. You don't need a tracking device. You don't need a GPS. You don't need to turn off your location services uh, to block the COVID tracking of when you came back from a trip or whatever. I'm just kidding. But anyway, to t- you don't need to do all of these things to tell anybody where you are. Your accent will give you away. Your accent will tell you if you're in a good place. Your accent will tell you if you're struggling. Your accent will tell you if you need a break. Your accent will tell you if you need Jesus. You know what I'm talking about. The true test is what's coming out of your mouth. Your accent will give you away. Somebody say amen. Amen. The men of Ephraim would come on over and they couldn't say shibboleth. They would say sibboleth. They had a speech impediment going on at this time. There was something wrong with what they were saying because they were not able to pronounce it or to enunciate for one reason or another. I told them, it, it, it told people where they were from. It told them where they grew up. It told them a lot of things about them. And you know what it was? It was a test. It was a test. They probably were thinking, what's the one word that they're going to come across? They don't know. They got no hologram on their, on, on their ticket. There's no watermark on their, on their, on their, on their ballot. Uh, there, there, there is no QR code or nothing like that coming across. There's no password. The only thing I can come up with is this. Can you say the word shibboleth? This is the only thing they can come across. They didn't say, let me see a necklace, let me see a birthmark, you know, let me see, do you have a tattoo behind your ear or something? No, no. Is there anything, like a little secret, co- There's no, is there a handshake? If I do this, 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 what are you going to do? If I TikTok that, what do you TikTok next? No, they, there was none of that. It was just, say the word with me now. On the count of three, say shibboleth. And they would say shibboleth. Your accent will tell you where you're from. Your accent will tell you where you are. From the crossing of the Jordan River to Peter being detected outside of the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, at the home of the high priest. Matthew chapter 26, verse 23. After a little while, those standing nearby came up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them, they said, for your accent gives you away. (laughs) Your accent gives you away. You got to be one of the Galileans. You from the north, right? You, you're one of the hillbillies up in the north and you came down. You were with Jesus. You're one of the 12 with Jesus. He goes, I don't know the man. And a little girl comes up to him and says, yes, surely you were with Jesus. I, I, I saw you. I couldn't saw. He goes, I don't even know the man, he's saying. And then all of a sudden, the last one says, surely you are. Your accent gives you away. He goes, no. And he swears. He says something really bad. And all of a sudden, we hear the Arakawa's rooster. <laughs> with the Palaka, red Palaka shirt. And all of a sudden he realizes that he's busted. He's been found out. And Jesus just looks at him. He goes, all of a sudden looks at him like this. (laughs) And he was undone. Peter was undone. Peter was over. He was over for Peter. Your accent will tell you if you are speaking like a commoner or you're speaking like a prince or a princess. See, I'm from Hawaii. I've got an accent. People say, ask me when they they meet me. So where are you from? Where are you from? I said, guess. And um, they said, well, I, I don't know. I, you sound like you're from Boston. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Boston? I get it. Maybe park the car, park the car. Just go park the car. You know, I don't know. Is, is it, is it, is it, is I not, I'm not using my R's on the way. I don't know what it is. Am I not enunciating enough? What, what is it? What is it? I know I'm from the Big Island, and that's another level of a dialect, a whole nother level of pigeon, everybody. My language or my accent tells me where I'm from, but it should also tell others where I'm headed. should also tell you people where you're headed. I believe the same principle is true when it comes to the kingdom of heaven. 
Jesus said in John chapter 6, my words are spirit and life. And in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus spoke with power. Jesus spoke with authority. Jesus spoke with life. So there was no misinterpretation of what Jesus was trying to accomplish. Jesus spoke life. There's no way that you could take Jesus' words out of context and make them your own. There's no way. There's no way because Jesus was absolutely clear. He had power. Jesus had authority. Uh, Speaking about being misinterpreted or misunderstood. Anybody ever been misinterpreted or misunderstood before? So I was in Thailand a long time ago on one of the first missionary trips. Uh, I I, I don't know if Brian was with me, but I I do know Vince Dobbinspeck and Stephen Ka'a. We were sitting down and I said, you know, we came so far. It would be really nice to get a Thai massage. You know what I'm talking about? I heard so much about them. The good kind, the reputable kind, okay? The real, you know, you know classy place, you know. Uh, I mean, transparent, all of that stuff. I don't, I don't, you know, anyway, I don't want that kind of ending. But anyway, um, um, I, I just want, I want it to be very, very good. I'm just being real with you all. I'm just playing with you, but at the same time. Uh, yeah, right, right. I just, I, just, I just want to leave the way I came. Anyway, the way I entered in. And so I'm sitting down, sitting down, and everybody's sitting all around, and we're sitting like this, and, and um, they're putting our feet in hot water, and they're giving, us, they're giving us, you know, hot tea, and I'm wearing a robe, and everybody's got robes on, pajama pants too, so, you know, that's cool. Big drawstring. Anyway, um, <laughs> well, you got to get the whole picture, you know what I'm saying? You're like... Why is he giving us so much detail? Because I want you to see the whole picture. So I'm like this, and Vince is over there. Vince is with his wife, Julie. Thomas is on the other side. Stephen is over there. Stephen's right here on my left. And, you know, we've got these curtain rooms. So you can go in there and curtain. You can, you can, you know, you can hear everybody. If I like, ah, there, everybody could hear that. So anyway, I'm right there, and I got my feet in the water. And, and I'm like, I've got a high threshold of pain when it comes to massages. Um, you just ask my wife. I said, you know, I'm not that kind of like, uh-huh. You know, I'm just like, like get, yeah, come on, put that elbow in there. Yes, yes, right there, right there. You know, I'm like that. I will guide you if you're my massage. I'll tell you exactly what to do. Don't, don't, don't tickle me. Just go right there. Anyway, just too much, TMI. <laughs> so my, my feet is in the water, and I'm like this. And, and, and I already said, you know, I, I, want, I, want the, I want the lady that seems like she can get the, you know, she can, she can probably press hard. And so... The lady who's in front of me, I looked at her and said, I, sh- I think she can press hard. And so my friend Steven's over here, and she's over there, and, I'm, and she, she looked at me, and she's washing my feet. And she goes, she was, she's washing my feet. She goes, you, 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 like, you like hot? I said, oh, oh yeah, you know, the water's hot, tea's hot, I like it hot, really hot. This is really good, thank you so much. Oh, okay, okay you like hot. I said, I, I, I love it hot. And then anyway, I didn't realize my first time in a Thai massage, and I didn't realize the contortionist moves that they put you into. You know what I'm talking about? It's just not fly, lie, flat in your face, put your face in that thing. It's like, okay, put your ankle, put it behind your head. You know, <laughs> let, let, me, let me dig my knee into you. And I just started getting worked. I started getting worked. And I'm over there, I'm like this, like, ah, ah. I'm still making noise, like, ah, ah. And everybody's giggling around me because I got the lady that can press hard. Like, ah, oh, my, oh, oh, oh. Ah, no, 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 no. Like, because my thighs and my hamstrings, I cannot handle. I have very sensitive thighs and hamstrings. Anyway, I'm like, ah! And everybody starts laughing. And I go, Stephen, you want to trade? Stephen goes, yeah, you probably like trade. I said, yes, this trade. I feel like she's going to break my femur or something. I don't know. So he trade, and she goes, I thought you like, I thought you like hot. I said, I like hot. You know, like hot. I said, oh, hard. Yeah, hot. Hard. Yeah, hot. I don't like hard. No wonder. It got lost in the translation. It was her accent or my accent. We just were not seeing eye to eye. Right now, so much is getting lost in translation. I am meant this, but you're receiving that. I didn't mean it like this, but you're taking it like that. And right now, our accent will definitely determine our location. Somebody say amen. amen. See, Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 says, from out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So every time a Christian leader opens his mouth, people in the world ought to recognize that this person speaks differently from everybody else. Different. People should hear that there is an accent, that there is an inflection to the tone of the statement's made by a Christian. You don't have to be a leader to have an accent of the kingdom. In fact, we all should be having an accent of the kingdom. 
if I were to tell you that we're all leaders, we all are anyway, no matter who you are, how old you are, people are watching you and you're leading them in the name of Jesus. So number one, your accent will reveal your location. Here's number two. Now, number two, here's what I'm learning on the crossings is not every insult requires you to reply. <clears throat> not every insult requires an apply, a reply. As a matter of fact, Jesus didn't reply to Pontius Pilate. Jesus didn't even reply to Herod. When he was cruci- before he was crucified, he replied nothing to nobody. All he did was speak to the two thieves on the cross, one thief on the cross, and the other person that he spoke to was his mother, and he spoke to John, and that's all the speaking that I remember him doing. As a matter of fact, when Pontius Pilate said to him, you know, I have the power of life and death pretty much. You know, I can let you go right now. Jesus didn't answer. He said, you the only power you got is from my father. My father gave you that power. Herod said, let me see you do something miracle, miraculous. Let me do, see you do something amazing. Jesus wouldn't even give in to him. And oftentimes we feel the need to defend ourselves and reply on someone that is spreading something or said something or commenting or whatever it is. Don't get into that trap. It's a big time trap. I'm telling you right now, it's a trap. So if you see this, I've got flies around my house. I have a good house, but right now when it rains, I don't know where these flies come. I think they come out of the grass. You know what I'm talking about? They just come. They're like baby larvae. You know what I'm saying? And all of a sudden, rain. They're like, oh, rain. We'll come to life. And they start flying all over like crazy. <laughs> Anybody getting a lot of problems with flies lately, right? So we got flies all over the place. And so what I decided to do the other day was do what I've done before. I go down to the hardware store and I pick me up one of these fly bags. What happens is you, un- you, you either cut off the top and you twist it, or this is one of the more expensive ones called a dollar more. You twist it and you open it up. When you open it up, you can see that this is where the flies would come in, right? There's an opening right here. But what you actually do is you fill it up with water to the water line right about here. There's a solution in here that actually, um, actually is very, very stink. It's actually meant to attract flies, okay? So if you can think of what smells attract flies, it smells like this. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> well, play the game of scratch and sniff. We can do that like you do. What is that? Oh, right? So what this is, is kind of like, this smells like, honestly, um, um, it smells like patis um, with bagong mixed together, with hamha, um, and maybe some shiracha. You know, mix it all up, <laughs> add some water to it. And this is what this thing smells like, because it's meant to catch flies. You feeling me, right? So when the thing was filled up and I already had my string um, tied up, I went to my palm tree to go tie it up. So, you know, you shake it a little bit. And if you shake it, then, you know, the the aroma says, here, flies, come, flies, come, 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 flies, come inside here. But anyway, I shook it. And as I shook it, I don't know what happened. I don't know if somebody that went before me sliced it with a razor blade before. But when I opened up this thing and I hung it, why are you laughing, Micah? Why are you laughing? The thing spilled all over my feet and all my brand new slippers. And I tell you what, all of a sudden, I became the fly trap. (laughs) What you need to be careful of. I'm going to say this. Social media has now become the fly trap. I get in and I get out. I just get in, like, 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 swipe, 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 get out. I get in, like, 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 swipe, 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 and I get back out. I get in, like, 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 swipe, 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 and I get out. Because you know why I'm worried about? I'm worried about all that stuff getting all over me again. Be very, very careful now. Am I, am I, are you feeling me? See, not every insult requires you to reply. And I've had a few. I had one guy take a picture of me on Memorial Day, Veterans Day, outside, and I looked at the flag and said, you see that flag? That's why we're here. It's Veterans Day. This is why we get to church. Yes, I know Jesus. I know that. It's a given. But because of the men and women who spilled their blood, this is why we're here. Come on. Right? And I come to church. Well, so someone took a shot of that. They used to go to this church back in the day, put it up on social media, and said, this pastor needs to get it straight. We're here because of Jesus. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Are you serious? So I know the kid. I know his family. I know all, all that we've done for them. I know how much we love them. And this is the youngest one. I'm thinking he must be a little lost. He's in the mainland. So I told Clint, Clint, can you go answer for me? Because I don't want to lose my witness. I don't want to ruin my testimony. Because my thumbs don't always do what my mind says to do. <laughs> I 
I might, I might, I might take some words and just Benny Hanna that thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> but I don't want to do that. Don't want to do that. So I composed a very gracious response, and Clint put it up for me. And the long story short is, did he require a response? No, he did not require a response. But why did I respond to him? Because he was part of his family's part of the family. And so Roger Archer always tells me this. And you can tell this is raw because you know, this is Saturday. But I really studied today, like another eight hours today, <laughs> to redo what I did for this weekend. And this is what he tells me. And maybe this might help you. Always be understanding while being misunderstood until they understand. Always be understanding while being misunderstood until they understand. And it might be a while before they understand. But always be understanding while being misunderstood until they understand. Because not everybody deserves a response. Not every insult needs another blow. Not every tooth needs another tooth. And not every, other, every eye needs another eye. Because in Judges chapter 12, verse 1, the Manassehite said, why didn't you call for us to help you fight against the Ammonites, the common enemy? And then it escalated. And then they said in Judges chapter 12, verse 1b, they said, they sent this message to Jephthah, why didn't you call us to help you fight against your Ammonites? We are going to burn down your house with you in it. It escalated. It went ballistic. So quickly. But Proverbs 15.1 says this, and I love this. A gentle answer <coughs> deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. A gentle answer deflects Anger. That's Frank. You can come up by yourself right now. Thank you. Think about this for a moment. It's kind of like putting a move back on somebody else. Like anybody here watch Ip Man? Yeah. Yeah. Keep your hands up if you watch Ip Man 1. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up if you watch Ip Man 2. Keep your hands up if you watch Ip Man 3. Keep your hands up if you watch Ip Man 4. Keep your hands up if you wish you were a Shaolin 2. <laughs> Just kidding. What I love... What I love about this on Ip Man, <coughs> and Ip Man is the guy that taught Bruce Lee how to fight. What I love about Kung Fu, although I don't know Kung Fu, although I do figure I can do some Prey Mantis moves. You know what I'm talking about? I can like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, your kung fu is better than my kung fu. Which style do you like? Korean style? Good style. I know already. I got it. I got it. I know how it works. But look at the verse. A gentle answer deflects anger. That's for all the young ones up there. I know you love this. I know you love this. Uncle Mike, Uncle Mike's going off today. A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. Ecclesiastes 10.12 says, words from the mouth of the wise are gracious, but fools are consumed by their own lips. We are more sensitive now than ever before. We are not required to be silent on things you don't agree with. You're not required to be silent. This is not that message. But what I'm saying is you must speak up if you must speak up. But it's the how and the what and the when that is very, very important. Psalm 141 verse 3 says, Oh Lord, set a guard over my mouth. Lord, keep watch over the door of my lips. I think some of us should say, Oh Lord, change my password immediately when you know I'm upset supernaturally change my password. That's why I like to say it. You need to Holy Ghost it before you post it. You need to, uh, we, we, we need to slow it down. 
We need to calm it down. It's inflamed. It's flammable. All it needs is a little spark and this thing can blow up easily. That friendship, that relationship, that contract. So many ramifications if we don't slow it down and slow our roll. That's why Psalm 19 verse 14 came to me, came to Clint this morning separately. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing or acceptable to you, O God, my Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations or the things I think about, I ponder of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. So how do we watch these things? What are the most important things that we've got to understand is what we've got to realize is when we're in the crossings, realize that there is a miracle. Here's number three, a miracle that is in your mouth. There is a miracle in your mouth because Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. So either death is in the power of the tongue and life is in the power of the tongue. They're both in the power of the tongue. You choose which fruit you want to eat. I want the fruit of life. I'm going to speak life over my family. Speak life over my kids. Speak life. I'm going to encourage. I'm going to compliment more. I'm going to remember to say things that are positive. I'm going to decrease the negative. De definitely do away with the hate. Little bit more constructive on the criticism. A whole le less of other things that are not necessary. We've got to guard our words because our children will copy us. They're going to watch us. The way dad responds is the way I learn how to respond. The way mom responds is the way I learn how to respond. I'm at the age of accountability. Long time ago, they're watching and they've always watched how we respond. I think what we've got to do is get better at this. We've got to get better with our words, better with our pauses, better with love, and better with preaching in the right way to our children and to our families and loving them. See, let's start speaking new realities over people's lives. New realities over people's lives. See, in a, in a time where people are piling it on, people are desperate for words of life. In a world where people are cruel with their words more than ever before, and the access in order to do that, the cyberbullying, the bullying, all of that, change your words, and you change your world. You really do. You change your words, and you change your world. So how many of us, like, we just talk, say bad things about ourselves. Nobody has to say it. We're already saying it to ourselves. We think about it. We think about it. And stop thinking so negatively about yourself. You have a higher opinion about yourself than and like God does. Gideon had such a low opinion of himself. God had a high opinion of God. Mighty warrior, the Lord is with you. And we keep playing the tapes over and over again. Stop it. Let's change it. Let's change it. The devil's trying to do anything that he can to discourage you. Anything that he can to discount you, anything that he can to get you to dumb down, anything that he can to make you stop, anything that he can to let you beat yourself up. Nobody needs to beat yourself up. I give you a hammer. You just beat yourself up all the time. You're good at that. Don't, don't do it anymore. Stop it. Speak. Spin it. Positive. Reframe it. Reframe it. You see these pictures right here? This is a 20-year-old picture. A 20-year-old picture and a 20-year-old frame. I've been thinking to myself, let me take it from the old frame, and if I reframe it and I put it in something new, isn't it better with a new frame? Doesn't an old picture look better with a new frame? Take out the old frames, keep the same picture, put a new frame on it, and it becomes a new picture all over again. I don't know, me and the props, we're going off on COVID with props. Think about this for a moment. Thomas Edison, the greatest inventor to ever live. Thomas Edison was told while he was nine years old, given a letter to take home to his mom in the late 1800s, he was very, very young, gave it to his mother, and the letter said, Thomas is mentally ill. Thomas is retarded. We no longer want to think we can teach him anymore. The mom read the letter. The mom was aghast. The mom could not believe what she just read. So she ended up going to see the teacher, 
When she got done talking to the teacher, she says, we're not going to have this teacher teach you. I'm going to teach you. She began to homeschool her son. She began to tell him every single day, you are a genius, Thomas. You are a genius, Thomas. Nobody understands you. I understand you, Thomas. You are a genius. Now listen, you are a genius. When Thomas Edison lost his mother, when his mother died, he found the diary that his mother wrote in. He didn't know that his mom wrote about him. Edison sobbed for hours before writing with conviction is his diary. Thomas Alva Edison was an adult child that thanks to the heroism of his mother became the genius of the century. This is what he wrote. He sobbed for hours because he actually found the letter that the teacher wrote in his mom's diary. Speak words of life. Speak positively. Let's change the words because let's realize that there's a miracle in your mouth in the name of Jesus. Amen? Come on. Can we shape the world? Can we frame things differently? Can we speak life over one another? Speak it over your kids? Believe them? Believe in God more than ever before? Come on. Let's, let's just close our eyes and bow our heads. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that as we come through life's crossings, when we get to certain places in our life, Father, we realize that even though we've gone through flood waters and the flood stage, which is what, really what shibboleth means, Father, we pray these things that as we come to the crossings of life, that we will be able to interpret what's going on. We'll be able, people will be able to tell by our language where we're from and where we're going. And Father, that we would realize so much more than ever before that your opinion of us is higher than our opinion of ourselves. And Lord, that we would continue to trust you that no matter what happens, we do not have to reply. We can respond, but we respond with peace in our hearts, knowing that even though we're being misunderstood, we will continue to understand until people come to an understanding. We love you, Lord, and we bless you in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed. I want to lead you in a different prayer and the prayer is saying, Jesus, I need you in my life. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, you're watching online or you're in this house today no matter what room you're in if you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus at the count of three I want you to raise your hand he's going to come into your heart he's going to change you from the inside out you will never be the same again I promise you but it's not that easy you have to follow him from that moment on you have to turn from your ways whatever that is and follow him and be willing to follow him it's not cheap what he gave was free. It's a free gift of Christ. The free gift by the blood of Jesus. The precious blood of Jesus. Precious. Expensive. Costly. That washes away our sins as white as snow. Although it cost him everything. Salvation cost you nothing. But to walk that out from that moment on, it will cost you everything. It could cost you everything. But Jesus paid it all. All to thee I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. If that's you today, at the count of three, you want to surrender your life to Jesus, you want him in your life, then raise your hand at the count of three. Here we go. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter how young you are. If you're ready to dedicate your life to Christ, I want you to raise your hand at the count of three. Here we go. One, two, three. Anybody here? This is Mike. I want Jesus in my life. Count me in that prayer. I want to surrender my life to him. Make him the Lord and the Savior of my life. Anybody online? Anybody here? It says, Mike, I want that. I want Jesus in my heart. Okay. I want everybody to repeat this prayer because there are people online who have clicked that hand. Everybody repeat this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, today I surrender. Give you my life. Thank you for dying on the cross shedding your blood that washes my sins as white as snow. Thank you for loving me before I first loved you and bringing me into a knowledge of how good you are and who you are in my life. We need you now more than ever before. Help us to reach more people, our neighbors, our family, and our friends and to shine that light and to shake that salt for the glory of God in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Come on, everybody. Let's praise the Lord.